<clears throat> All right, so again, welcome to Dental CE Academy, and this is the recording on demand of our live presentation on October 2nd, 2023. And for those of you that are watching the recording to complete the quiz, please scroll below the video that you're watching right now to the instruction box and you will see the link to the quiz and the handout as well. The course today is supported by Perio Protect and I want to make sure that we uh, do give them a shout out for their tremendous support of many of our programs here at Dental CE Academy. I've not received an honorarium. I declare no financial affiliation with Perio Protect. No corporate entity has influenced or contributed to the content of this presentation. I am the chief education officer and an employee of Dental CE Academy. That is our live agenda there for you. And uh, many learning objectives that we will be covering in this presentation. Now, my background, I'm a public health dentist. I'm here in Phoenix, Arizona, and I was the chief for the Office of Oral Health for Maricopa County's Public Health Department. And one of my many roles at Maricopa County Public Health was to develop a maternal oral health program. And it was um, a program that still continues to today. It has been um, modeled across the US. It was one of the largest in the US, if not the largest. Um, and I have many success stories about that program. I was able to collaborate with the um, Mexican consulate here in Phoenix, their federal government, to be able to screen mothers of childbearing years in um, their uh, embassy. So that was a huge, huge undertaking between a county government and a federal government. It's very successful and it also continues until today. So we know that oral health is closely related to overall health and to the quality of life, and that's the World Health Organization. And we know the significance of oral health and healthy pregnancies. Oral health is important across all lifespans, and particularly during pregnancy, and it involves two patients, right? All considered treatment must provide a benefit to the mother while minimizing risk to the fetus. And oral disease has been implicated in adverse pregnancy outcomes, which we'll be discussing today. Oral disease in the mother can lead to early childhood caries in her child, and managing oral disease during pregnancy is vital to both mother and child. And we know that there are multifactorial barriers that exist to prevent or delay dental treatment for pregnant women. Often women do not seek dental care um, inclusive of their prenatal care. They may not be advised to seek dental care. There are limitations that um, are imposed on providing oral, oral care to pregnant women. Um, often there's a misunderstanding or lack of knowledge it creates a significant impact on the quality, quality of life and safety of the mother and the unborn child. And many dentists routinely deny or they delay treatment due to concerns of injury to the fetus, um, as well as fear of litigation. Alternatively, prenatal providers may not have been trained in their oral systemic connection and they fail to refer their patients to dental providers. Although I think that's changing quite a bit over the last decade or so. Ultimately, there is a coordination of care that is required between the medical and dental uh, provider community that is required to benefit maternal and child oral health outcomes. So it's expected that a woman should see her dentist during pregnancy at least once for preventive care. We know that gestation is 42 weeks. There are three trimesters that are 14 weeks apart. And it's expected that women should see the dentist again for preventive care at least once during the pregnancy based on twice yearly visits or six month intervals. But those are women, women that enjoy oral health. What about many women that don't enjoy oral health that have existing conditions? They should be of course seeking treatment more frequently. Now, uh, Carolina, this is not pre-recorded. It is live. 
to access the handout for those of you watching live, please go to the chat area. There's an orange box. You will see a link. If you registered before 4 p.m. Pacific time today, it was sent to you via email. Okay, 75% of more pregnant women experience an oral health problem. This was a Cigna survey in 2015, and it really still pertains today. Cigna, as you know, uh, many of you, is an insurance company. And in this survey, it was um, an online survey that went out to pregnant women and those who delivered within the past 12 months. These were women between the ages of 21 and 45, 800 and to 801 total women participated. They looked at 200 pregnant women with dental insurance, 200 without dental insurance, 201 new mothers with dental insurance and 200 new mothers without dental insurance. And the results here, 76% of these pregnant women reported having an oral health problem, 76%. 33% bleeding gums, no big surprise there. 22% had a toothache, 27% increased tooth sensitivity, and 57% actually visited a dentist during their pregnancy. Almost half of these surveyed women did not visit the dentist during pregnancy despite having dental problems. The cost here was cited as one of the main reasons why pregnant women did not visit the dentist. And again, this is an insurance survey. They sell dental insurance, but uh, women without insurance were twice as likely as those uh, with insurance to not visit the dentist during pregnancy. And healthcare professionals may be able to reduce this abysmal statistic by messaging to women, especially women of childbearing years, about the importance of dental visits. Pregnant women are often not uh, told the importance of their oral health. This was a prenatal consensus statement. This was the California Dental Association back in 2010. It's excellent. Um, it was an expert panel evidence-based guidelines for oral health during pregnancy and early childhood. And the statement is as follows, prevention, diagnosis, and the treatment of oral diseases, including needed dental radiographs and the use of local anesthesia are highly beneficial and can be undertaken during pregnancy with no additional fetal or maternal risk when compared to the risk of not providing care. So good oral care and control of oral disease protects a woman's health and quality of life and has the potential to reduce the transmission of pathogenic bacteria from mothers to their children. Okay, the maternal oral health triad here, um, prenatal, post, perinatal, and postnatal. And this is really a continuum for many women during childbearing years. We define prenatal as prior to conception, perinatal three months prior to one month post delivery, and postnatal is one month following pregnancy. And this is my statement. Um, we hear that oftentimes, when should a child be taken to the dentist for the first time? And my reply is, in utero, the mother should be treated. The mother should be treated before she has the opportunity to pass along these pathogens to this infant at birth. So the ideal time to prevent early childhood caries is actually prior to birth. We should be treating active caries. We should not be watching it or managing it until this patient delivers. Women of childbearing years, pre, peri, and postpartum should be counseled to promote oral health prior to conception. Oftentimes at the most critical stage, organogenesis, the first trimester, the pregnant patient we know may be unaware that they're pregnant. They can walk into your practice on a Tuesday and check off that they are not pregnant and they have conceived the following Sunday. So we have to take advantage of the time that these women are in our dental chair in terms of messaging and providing the treatment and promoting the importance of their oral health, not just to their own um, 
health, but to that of their unborn children. Oral health care should be extended to the entire family because of the vertical and lateral transmission of infection and pregnant women should be counseled that dental treatment is safe during their pregnancy. We should treat all women of childbearing years as potentially pregnant. Again, they may not be aware that they're pregnant. They may be sitting in your chair. And again, they may be uh, fully conceived three days later. So oral health should be an extension of postpartum care to include all health professionals. And the reduction of bacteria in the mother, their nutritional status, their oral hygiene, all critical to the prevention of disease in their newborn child. So again, the takeaway message here is treatment of women of childbearing years is a continuum. Optimal oral health and dental treatment protects and promotes the women's health and quality of life before, during, and after pregnancy. Okay. Recommendations for perinatal oral health include oral health education, oral hygiene, diet counseling, fluoride treatment, professional oral health care, xylitol gum, chlorhexidine rinse. Educate the mother or the caregiver on behaviors that may directly pass saliva to the child. So eliminating the sharing of eating utensils, cups, food, pacifiers, etc. Counsel the smoking mother. Yes, there are mothers that smoke. Um, communication with all health all healthcare providers involved with pregnancy management. So the significance of prenatal oral health, the overall health status of the mother prior to pregnancy, is critical to her overall health and pregnancy outcome. And often, as we said, women may be unaware that they're pregnant in the first trimester. We know it's a critical time. Oral health promotion should be provided to all women of childbearing years as a cautionary tale. The same messaging as alcohol, tobacco, and so forth. Smoking, alcohol, drug use, oral and medical health status influence the overall health of the mother and therefore the fetus and child well before conception. So we should encourage and promote oral health and overall health in women of childbearing age. Perinatal health, um, oral health again, perinatal is three months prior to one month following birth. And we consider lactation in some cases as an extension of the perinatal time. And we know that there are a multitude of studies out there uh, scientifically uh, based in peer reviewed journals. We're not talking about Prevention Magazine and so forth. We're talking about peer reviewed, scientifically based information. Mother's oral health during pregnancy closely related to the oral health of her newborn. And we're gonna be looking at some of these studies shortly. And here's uh, just a few for you. Okay, general health is important throughout life and particularly during pregnancy and pregnancy is characterized, we know, by physiological and psychological changes, some of which can adversely affect oral health. So let's talk about a few of these physiologic changes during pregnancy because it's necessary to understand what these are so that we can outweigh the risk versus the benefits. So pregnancy, we know, causes profound changes in the physiology of the female patient. And in treatment planning, we have a, must have a current understanding of maternal and fetal physiology so we can determine the benefits of providing dental care during pregnancy and um, determine that they far outweigh the potential risk. So what are some of these physiologic changes? Well, cardiovascular, hematologic, respiratory, gastrointestinal, genitourinary, endocrine, oral facial systems. Some of these changes include increased blood volume as we see, concurrent anemia, hormones, hormonal changes, progesterone and relaxin levels may cause increased laxity in preparation for childbirth. It can manifest as tooth mobility and more. Let's start with the cardiovascular system. So increased uterine mass can cause impression, compression, excuse me, of the inferior vena cava leading to venous stasis, so pooling of the blood, and increased risk for deep venous thrombosis. We may see uh, physiologic changes on an electrocardiogram. We may hear extra heart sounds, so a, a physiologic um, heart murmur. 
pregnant patient shows a significant change in blood volume and cardiac output, as well as changes in systemic vascular resistance. We'll see a decrease in blood pressure, the potential occurrence of supine hypotensive syndrome, which we will talk about. The volume of plasma increases 40 to 50%. This causes a dilution of red blood cells, physiologic anemia, if you will, and the body will compensate by producing red blood cells with larger mass, 20 to 30%. This creates a need for increased iron and folic acid intake. Cardiac output increases 30 to 50% during pregnancy. This is secondary to a 20 to 30% increase in heart rate, as well as a 20 to 50% increase in stroke volume. And these changes produce a functional heart murmur and tachycardia in 90% of women, which normally disappears shortly after delivery. Hematologic, the uh, pregnant woman is in a hypercoagulable state. This leads to an increased risk for thrombosis, embolism, leukocytosis, and physiologic anemia again due to increased circulating volume as well as generalized immunosuppression, the body needs to recognize the fetus as self or it's going to reject it. So the body goes into sort of a simplistically an immunosuppressed state. Okay, respiratory increased mucosal fragility, increased risk of airway edema, epistaxis with manipulation of the nasal airway, we see a decreased PaO2 when the patient is supine or lying flat. That can lead to an increased risk of hypoxia, decreased functional residual capacity, progesterone-induced hyperventilation. Now, many women develop a rhinitis while they're pregnant. It's difficult for them to breathe through their nose. We should be asking them about that especially if we may need to use oxygen on them or nitrous oxide, or we're going to place a rubber dam and we should be using a rubber dam, especially on pregnant women. That's something we should be asking them about. A uh, famous musician, if you will, Cardi B, suffered from pregnancy rhinitis, constantly posting about it. In fact, she had some months where she was not able to perform because of pregnancy right now. So it's fairly common and we need to find out from our patient um, if that's something that's affecting them. Gastrointestinal, of course, the loss of lower esophageal sphincter tone from laxity, from progesterone and so forth, and relaxant hormones can lead to an increased risk of reflux disease, decreased gastric motility, increased intragastric pressure, and genitourinary loss of intravascular protein causes a decreased osmotic pressure, which leads to peripheral edema. You'll see pregnant women, especially towards their uh, third trimester with puffy hands, they can't wear their rings, swollen ankles, swollen face, increased glomerular filtration rate, urinary stasis leads to an increased risk of urinary tract infections. <clears throat> and of course the endocrine systems there's an increase in ingesterone in estrogen progesterone thyroxine steroids insulin levels and an increase in the circulating dihydroxycholecalciferol super uh, supine hypotensive syndrome many of you are probably familiar with but during the second and third trimesters there's a decrease in blood pressure and cardiac output uh, that can occur when the patient is lying flat so um, it's due to decreased venous return to the heart from the compression of the inferior vena cava by the uterus, and that can result in a 14% reduction in cardiac output. And there are mediators that are thought to be involved, progesterone, prostaglandins, nitric oxide that cause peripheral vasodilation and venodilation. Um, and this can all lead to hypotension, bradycardia, syncope when the patient is laying flat. So uh, we need to be aware that a patient in the second or third trimester should probably not be positioned all the way flat. 
um, we're going to see that we want to be able to lift their right hip, having them turn slightly onto the left hip, and they should be raised up in the chair a little bit in case they're having gastric reflux or nausea. Because this can lead to hypotension, again, nausea, dizziness, and fainting. And again, we're going to elevate that right hip 10 to 12 centimeters, placing that patient in a 5 to 15% tilt on their left side to relieve pressure on the inferior vena cava. And if hypotension is still not relieved, we're going to check their blood pressure. We can do that on pregnant women. Um, a full left lateral position may be needed. Now, respiratory system, we said there are respiratory changes that are consequential because of the uterus increasing in size, of course, as well as the demands of maternal fetal oxygen requirements. So diaphragmatic displacement occurs because the fetus is enlarging. It increases intrathoracic pressure. It can increase the chest circumference and cause a 15 to 20% reduction in functional residual capacity. That's the volume of gas that remains in the lungs during rest, resting expiratory level or at the end of a normal expiration. Now in the first trimester, hypoventilation begins at that point, it can increase by 42% in the late, in late pregnancy. Shortness of breath, dyspnea is a common complaint of pregnant women, second to uh, third trimester. And because pregnant patients, again, can develop moderate hypoxemia, it is not prudent to position them in the supine position. Upper airway changes, we spoke about the upper airway mucosa, it's more friable um, and edematous due to increased estrogen levels in pregnant women, up to one third experience severe rhinitis that can cause frequent nosebleeds and upper respiratory tract infections. Circulation, so an increase in the number of erythrocytes and leukocytes and the erythrocyte sedimentation rate can be seen an increased rise we said in red blood cell mass called physiologic anemia or causing physiologic anemia and an increase and decrease in some of the clotting factors, which may increase the risk for thromboembolism. And pregnant women have five times the risk for thromboembolic events. Uh, gastrointestinal changes. So probably the most famous one we know is morning sickness, right? Morning sickness does not have to occur only in the morning though. For some of us lucky ones, it could have been 24 seven. Um, morning sickness occurs because of the hormonal effects of estrogen and progesterone. It usually resolves by the end of the first trimester, but not always. In my case, I had morning sickness with my daughter um, 24 seven for the first trimester but I had a one hour window from six to seven o'clock every evening where I seemed to have some uh, respite from it. And I was taking at the time comparative vertebrae anatomy at Cal. So they allowed me to bring home my specimens and keep them in our freezer so that I could get my um, dissections done during that six to seven window. Otherwise, there was no way. There were not enough rice crackers in my day to be able to get through that class. So nausea, vomiting, acid reflux, heartburn due to the enlarging fetus and um, hormonal changes and reflux as a result of increased intragastric pressure because of the enlarged fetus, we see a slower gastric emptying rate, decreased resting pressure, of the lower gastroesophageal sphinct sphincter. So that leads to this condition of sort of gastric reflux and so forth. So we have to be careful with these patients. Um, we don't wanna schedule them when they have morning sickness and they're gonna be able to tell you when is the worst time and when is the better time. Um, we certainly don't wanna lay them flat and we wanna caution them about what they eat before they come in, right? So we have to be very extra careful and of course, um, oral hygiene wise, it's a good idea for them to hold off brushing their teeth for about an hour after vomiting and rinse with a baking soda solution to neutralize the acid. 
So Natasha is saying that Amy Schumer had pregnancy hyperemesis, hyper excuse me, her entire pregnancy. Um, and that was um, something that I have experienced with many of my patients. You know, that sends them to the hospital uh, for dehydration and IVs and so forth. The baking soda solution, no real science there, a teaspoon to an eight ounce glass of uh, lukewarm water. Endocrine changes here. We said hormones are responsible for the physiologic changes during pregnancy. Estrogen, progesterone, human gonadotrophin. Um, the placenta is a temporary gland. It is there for a few reasons. One is to produce these hormones. All right, so we'll see an increase in thyroxine, steroids, insulin levels, gestational diabetes. 45% of pregnant women are unable to produce sufficient insulin levels. Risk factors for gestational diabetes, positive family history, type 2 diabetes mellitus, obesity, ethnicities, including Hispanic, African American, Native American, Southeast Asian or Pacific Islander are those over the age of 25. I had gestational diabetes. So I had to test my blood sugar five times a day. I was on a very restricted diet during my pregnancy. I was on bed rest for 20 weeks and I had no known risk factors at the time except I was 25. That was my only risk factor. I had um, really no other positive family history and it was a complete surprise to me. Dental treatment during gestational diabetes, of course, periodontal screening is very important. Treatment and close monitoring of periodontal disease. It used to be thought that a patient, um, once they delivered gestational diabetes goes away, and the placenta is delivered and everything's back to normal. Now we know that's not necessarily the case. These patients should be closely followed. Okay, oral and facial changes, gingivitis, gingival hyperplasia, pyogenic granuloma, so pregnancy tumor, salivary changes that are mediated by increased estrogen levels. You'll see hypersalivation in these patients. When you're using a rubber dam, you are going to have to suction these poor patients more frequently so they don't drown. Okay, you're going to pull away that rubber dam and they are going to be completely filled with saliva and it's going to be this stringy, ropey saliva. This is why it's hormonally mediated. Elevated estrogen. We'll see increased capillary permeability. We may see gingivitis because of this pregnancy gingivitis, gingival hyperplasia. We know pregnancy can worsen or exacerbate exacerbate existing periodontal disease. We know that we said relaxin, increased hormonal levels can cause teeth to become mobile. When I was in a um, public health clinic uh, a few years back, we had refugees coming into our clinic from El Salvador, every single one of these patients, and they were young, some of them under the age of 20 with class three mobility. So we were scaling and root planing every one of these patients. Once they delivered, however, the mobility went away. So question is, you know, hormonal, some genetics in play. Did the um, uh, periodontal therapy add to the uh, improved outcomes? We're not going to know, but definitely there had to have been some genetics going on. Every one of those patients. Now, what are pyogenic granulomas? We call those pregnancy tumors. This is due to increased vascularization, angiogenesis, increased hormones, oftentimes caused by some sort of gingival irritation. It may be some subging calculus or some plaque, sort of like a grain of sand in an oyster. It sort of causes this growth to occur. Often occurs in the first and second trimester and normally you're going to want to remove these after they de uh, deliver because it will come right back. Um, sometimes when I was providing scaling and root planning in public health, if I came upon 
pregnancy, um, uh, uh, pyogenic granuloma, and especially if it was near muscle attachment, I would go ahead if I was cleaning up that area with quantum scaling and remove it just because I was there and the patient was numb. Increased salivary estrogen may lead to favorable environment for bacterial growth, as we know, increased caries, hormonal mediated inflammatory oil changes, melasma, known as the mask of pregnancy, usually fades after pregnancy, not all the time though, and can be seen also in the use of hormonal drugs such as birth control pills. And pharmacologic effects during pregnancy. So we know that drug clearance is greater during pregnancy. There's a higher volume of drug distribution, a lower maximum plasma concentration, lower plasma half-life, higher lipid solubility, and drugs we know can have a deleterious consequence during pregnancy, and it can include miscarriage, uh, birth defects, teratogenicity, and low birth weight, to name a few. And lactation, of course, poses challenges to newborn health because some of these medications are excreted in the breast milk. So newborn toxicity would depend upon the chemicals involved, the dose frequency duration, and the amount of breast milk consumed. So we wanna minimize pharmacologic risk. We want to understand the safety aspects of commonly used and prescribed medications to minimize adverse outcomes. And really in dentistry relative to medicine, we prescribe few medications. Um, there are a smaller number of drugs that are teratogenic causing birth defects and several categories that are known to be teratogenic. Alcohol, which we don't prescribe in dentistry anymore, tobacco, which we don't prescribe in dentistry anymore, cocaine, which we don't prescribe in dentistry anymore, thalidomide, which was used in the 50s to treat various conditions, including um, morning sickness and tragically caused uh, horrible birth defects, methylmercury, anticonvulsants, warfarin, um, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors, Retinoids, if you've heard of um, retinoic acid or Accutane, that is a retinoid, and some microbials. Now, the FDA classifies uh, five classifications of drugs according to the relative safety during pregnancy. And this is old school here, but I wanted you to be aware of these categories, okay? So category A, drugs that were studied in humans and their evidence supports safe use. Category B, these drugs show no evidence of risk to humans, generally considered safe during pregnancy. Category C are drugs that should be used with caution during pregnancy, such as aspirin. And then category D, drugs not to be used during pregnancy, such as tetracycline due to staining. And category X, drugs not to ever be used in um, during pregnancy. Now, most antibiotics cross the placenta. So when we're looking at antibiotics, there are a couple of things that I want you to be very familiar with. First of all, let me ask you all, how many of you are prescribing clindamycin to your pen allergic patients or is your practice prescribing clindamycin to your pen allergic patients? go ahead and type yes into the chat area, whether this is for prophylaxis or otherwise. Okay, so looking at the answers we have here, I'm going to say 95% of you that have answered, and there's only been about 50 of you have um, answered yes. So let me offer you some advice. Clindamycin was removed from the guidelines by the American Dental Association in 2017 and 2021 because it, the boxed warning for C. difficile, Clostridium difficile infection and the number of dentists that were being sued because of patient outcomes where patients were developing adverse events 
from clindamycin. So clindamycin is no longer recommended for your penallergic patients or really at all. It should be removed from your practice, um, whether your patient is pregnant or not. Um, I happen to be living proof that it does cause C. difficile. And um, uh, the problem here is that many of the dentists did not get the message. Some of them may, if their patient gets C. difficile and they find themselves in front of a jury. Okay, so you want to stop prescribing clindamycin. Now I'm going to offer you resources on our website. They are free. And there are two courses, one by Dr. Tom Palmeyer from the American Dental Association, who is the co-author for the antibiotic guidelines. And that is a three and a half hour course. It's on demand. You can start it and stop it as you wish. He offers forms for your practice. Um, it is probably one of the best CE courses you will take all year. The other course is by Dr. Deborah Goff, also in the new antibiotic guidance. It's an hour and a half. She's an infectious diseases expert and a clinical pharmacist. We're going over every antibiotic um, for you as well. So if you have some, uh, a dentist in your office who's a non-believer, you may want them to understand these courses are available to them. Um, we do have cases of patients that are dying from these prescriptions. A half million become infected with C. difficile every year and 30,000 die. I almost died. Uh, we have pregnant women that get C. difficile as well. And um, you want to talk about a double whammy. That's just a horrible, tragic situation. Okay, so uh, the standard preferred, there is no standard preferred. Please take the course and understand how to develop the correct prescribing practice for a penallergic patient based on the current guidelines. Um, is a rest and safe as an adjunct therapy? I can't go there right now. You can take our course on C. difficile as well. Um, again, if you're not sure what to prescribe your penallergic patients, if not clindamycin, please take those courses. There is a flow chart for you. It's not a black and white answer here, folks. It's like anything else you prescribe. It's not a one size fits all. Okay, thanks Go, um, for answering that. And again, um, we do have cases of pregnant women that develop C. difficile. Some of them develop C. difficile in the hospital with uh, C-section. So it's really important too, when you're prescribing the antibiotic to any patient, to ask them if they have had a C. difficile infection because they will have a recurrence most likely if you prescribe an antibiotic. Um, all right, so let's talk about antibiotics now in the pregnant women. Most antibiotics cross the placenta. Um, we don't prescribe that many antibiotics in dentistry, but of those that we do, of course, when we remove clindamycin from our formulary altogether, it was removed by the American Dental Association. Avoid erythromycin in its estulate form because it's been associated with an increased risk of reversible subclinical hepatotoxicity in approximately 10% of pregnant women. Of course, avoid the tetracyclines because of staining. Uh, metronidazole, also known as flagyl, used cautiously. And um, again, there's your clindamycin warning right there. Remove 2017 and 2021. If you're still prescribing and your patient develops C. difficile and they die, or they become very ill and lose their colon and they're pooping in a bag for the rest of their life, the jury is going to ask you why you did not follow the current ADA recommendations. Bam, that's it. Write your check. There you go. And there's the boxed warning for C. difficile and clindamycin. Okay, um, again, there are some antimicrobial resources for you. These were the classes that I mentioned earlier. Feel free to take advantage of these classes. They're at no charge to you. Uh, let's talk about analgesics. Um, avoid aspirin 
because it can cause possible hemorrhaging close to delivery date. Acetaminophen is usually advised, uh, but it does carry a slight hepatic risk, placing it in category B. The risk cannot be ruled out. And then NSAIDs. Okay, NSAIDs carry a risk of cardiac septal defects, so not advised in the first and third trimester with limited use. And then COX-2 inhibitors avoid late in pregnancy. We don't practice in a silo. So when you are seeing a pregnant patient for the first time, it's a great idea to transcribe a letter and send it to their obstetric team. I'm Dr. Jones. I'm treating your patient for their oral care. These were my findings. This is our treatment plan. These are the medications we intend to use. This is the prognosis. Keep them informed. Ask them for their opinion on the medications. They may come back and say, local anesthetic is great. Please do not use Epi. Now, the next few slides talk about the fact that the use of local anesthetics and dental treatment during pregnancy did not pose a major teratogenic risk in these studies. Therefore, there is no reason, this is the American Dental Association, to prevent pregnant women from receiving dental treatment, radiographs, necessary radiographs, and local anesthetic. Nitric oxide safe in pregnant patients when local anesthesia is inadequate. The maximum level, 30%. Decreased levels required during pregnancy. That is different than occupational exposure of pregnant employees because of a cumulative effect. You women out there of childbearing years should ask for a nitric oxide badge. You can go to the American Dental Association site, see the companies that offer these so that you know what your chronic exposure is, whether or not you're pregnant, because it can affect your ability to conceive or lead to miscarriage. The scavengers that you have in many of these practices may be old, they may be inadequate. All right, so get yourself a badge so that you know what your exposure is. Okay, so guidelines for drugs used during lactation and pregnancy. Again, the antibiotics we're concerned about are erythromy erythromycin in their estolate form, as well as clindamycin. Remove clindamycin from your formulary for all of your patients. Local anesthetic is there, FDA categories C and B. Our analgesics stick with acetaminophen when at all possible. If you need anything stronger, have a conversation with the obstetric team. And the next few graphs tell us what procedures can we perform on our pregnant patients and basically any procedure as long as it's necessary. Now, your patient may feel better waiting till after the first trimester. And for the most part, most women are going to come to you probably after the first trimester because that's when many of them find out that they are pregnant. But in the first trimester, you're going to want to avoid metronidazole. Um, and the third trimester, we're not going to use uh, NSAIDs, avoid sulfonamides. And of course, never use tetracycline, erythromycin in its estolate form, and clindamycin. So there are the guidelines for you. But we do not want to cherry pick treatment either. We don't want to say, you know what, let's just um, address this emergency today. We're not going to take any x-rays and have them come back after they deliver. Because if the patient has an infection that you haven't diagnosed, uh, it puts the patient at risk their unborn child at risk, and really your practice at risk as well. These are known teratogens and their fetal effects. Um, again, tobacco, cleft lip and palate, um, retinoids. So Accutane would be an example of that. Of course, cleft palate is one of those uh, effects of high doses of vitamin A, such as retino uh, retinoic acid. Um, and that can include the skin ointments as well. So there is no evidence 
relating early spontaneous abortion to first trimester oral health care or dental procedures. Common complications during pregnancy we know include miscarriage, preterm birth, low birth weight, uh, preeclampsia, and gestational diabetes. And we know that the control of oral disease in pregnant women may have the potential to reduce the transmission of oral bacteria from mothers to their children. Preeclampsia, this is a condition um, that is managed by the obstetric team. It can uh, lead to hypertension. So of course you wanna be taking blood pressures on all of your patients, but it's also been linked to the presence of oral disease as a potential causative factor in pregnant women. Periodontal disease, um, there's quite a bit of controversy that still surrounds the link of periodontal disease as a causative factor in preterm labor and low birth weight babies, often because the reverse hasn't been shown to improve patient outcomes. I was involved in a large study where we were performing quadrant scaling and root planning on hundreds and hundreds of women, and it made no difference on the birth weight and the... Um, Excuse me. Sorry, folks, that was an Amazon order that I was not expecting. All right. So again, the reverse is not necessarily true. And we haven't been able to prove in all studies that if we're performing quadrant scaling and root planning on women, are we actually able to improve low birth weight, um, time to conception and delivery time. So those studies are still ongoing. So of course, patient education, oral health promotion is required for women of all childbearing years some of them may be having cravings. Their diet may not be up to what it should be. We should be questioning them about that. And how can we help them? We discussed supine hypotensive syndrome earlier, and there is the positioning that we should be using. So we require a comprehensive examination and treatment plan. Um, and this is no different than any of our patients. Again, cherry picking is not advised here. Oral hygiene instructions, the same. We want to reduce inflammation in the patient, the bacterial load in the child. I recommend xylitol chewing gum four to five times a day or mints. Uh, radiographs during pregnancy are not contraindicated and they should be utilized as required to complete a full examination and diagnosis. The same with restorative dentistry. In the case of removing amalgams, we should be doing so with a rubber dam. That's standard of care and we should be removing all active caries. We don't want this mother to deliver and have a child in a situation who's being bombarded with bacteria from the mother. Lactation amalgam restorations. The FDA states that uh, there's no adverse health effects from mercury in the breast milk. Uh, for my own peace of mind, I'm going to use, I'm going to use a rubber dam. I don't think that uh, that gives me any sense of, um, I don't know, protection of the patient or, or, or the unborn child. I'm going to be using a rubber dam and doing everything I can in terms of my evacuation to make sure I'm not exposing anybody to unnecessary uh, mercury vapor. Teeth whitening should be delayed until the patient delivers and they're um, completely done with lactation. First trimester recommendations secure. Again, over 50% of miscarriages occur during this time unrelated to dental treatment. There's no evidence that we need to withhold or delay treatment. But again, that is a discussion you are going to have with your patients. Certainly second trimester, the same. And third trimester, what we really need to be concerned about here is patients that are uncomfortable. They are going to require more restroom breaks. Uh, we're going to need to make sure that we prevent supine hypotension by proper uh, positioning but everything else can be performed when required. Periodontal disease, we know may lead to low birth weight babies, preterm labor, stillbirth, preeclampsia, adverse pregnancy outcomes linked to the following. And um, again, we have some citations for you. Common misconceptions of oral health in pregnant women, 
health literacy, access to care, and just belief systems that dentistry cannot be safely performed. We know that inflammation from peri disease is a risk factor for developing preeclampsia in the mother. Um, periodontal disease may be linked to stillbirth. There's a case that was linked to fusiform nucleatum that we'll see. It's also linked to low birth weight, preterm labor, and the mechanism there is thought to be endotoxins produced by gram-negative bacteria. And periodontal disease may be linked to increased time to conception. Risk factors, pathogens we know are responsible for periodontal disease, but there are other considerations that may be um, included in the severity of periodontal disease. And these risk factors can include, of course, genetics and other external factors. Dental treatment in pregnant adolescents, 83% of pregnant adolescents are from low income families. They have a greater risk of becoming pregnant again. They are not miniature adults and they are great high risk, are greater uh, high risk pregnancies, right? And often um, oral care is in most teenagers, not a priority and in pregnant teenagers as well. So don't expect them to be miniature adults just because they're pregnant. We know that there are many barriers to oral health care, and this was a study that looked at 10 years publications, 14 studies, stating that dentists have doubts and fears about the care of pregnant women to a greater or lesser degree, especially with regard to the use of x-rays, prescriptions, and ideal gestational period of treatment. And we spoke of periodontal disease, and quote this model form, model form of pregnancy gingivitis. So I want to end this here in a few minutes. But um, here at Maricopa County, I was able to perform salivary testing on thousands of pregnant women. And what we found was interesting and concerning because we were screening these women in areas where we did not have sinks. We could not probe because they were going to bleed. Um, but I wanted some way to identify potential pathogens. And what I found was that the women that I would have identified as pregnancy gingivitis, 18, 19, 20 year old women who had bleeding gums, um, actually had quite advanced and aggressive periodontal infections as shown by the salivary tests. So don't automatically assume what you're looking at is pregnancy gingivitis. And I would really encourage salivary testing. Uh, pregnancy, diabetes, gestational diabetes, and the diabetic pregnant women, we should be seeing these patients with frequency as well after they deliver. And um, we know that caries in the mother may lead to an increased risk of developing decay in the unborn child, may link, uh, be linked to low birth weight infants, preterm delivery. And this was a case of a mother who uh, delivered an infant a few days after a respiratory infection. The infant tragically was born by stillbirth. And an autopsy showed that bacteria from the mother's oral infection, which was fusiform nucleatum, was isolated to the infant's lungs as well as the placenta. And the mother had been diagnosed with gingiv uh, pregnancy gingivitis, not periodontal infection. Okay, inflammation from periodontal disease is a risk factor for developing preeclampsia in the mother. So the goal of perinatal oral health care, reduce the level of active decay causing bacteria in the pregnant mother's mouth, arrest the infection, the decay to delay or prevent infection in her unborn infant. When that infant is born and salivary activities begin, that infant will become inoculated on their tongue, the posterior aspect of the tongue with mutant streptococci and other bacteria. And as those teeth erupt and they're not fully mineralized, they are at great risk for decay, especially when you add other substrates on top of it, sunny delight, more bacteria, Cheetos, et cetera. Okay, this is the front of our medical school library at UCSF and postnatal oral health as we close. To reduce disease transmission among our family members, oral health should really be considered a family affair because all 
Members of the family should be screened for dental disease to avoid vertical and lateral transmission. It's a teachable moment in the public health clinic. I welcome the whole family to come into the operatory. I wanted to see how everybody else looked when they smiled and they talked. And if grandma had a mouthful of decay and grandma was going to be involved in taking care of that child, I was going to make the advice that they all be screened and they all be treated before this child was born and for those children that were already born. Um, oral hygiene as we close, toothbrushing, uh, daily flossing. We spoke about morning sickness, rinse with a cup of water with a teaspoon of baking soda, wait an hour before brushing. Using xylitol products are very effective. Chlorhexidine rinse can be used. I'm not a fan of chlorhexidine rinse. It's a poor antiviral. We have better uh, products out there, especially your xylitol rinses. Um, diet nutrition, healthy diet is required. Find out if they have any bizarre food cravings. Fluoride uh, is up to you and your patient. And I'm a fluoride varnish believer if I am using fluoride. The American Academy of Pediatric Dentistry advises every pregnant woman should have an oral evaluation, be counseled on proper oral hygiene, and be referred to a dentist for preventive and therapeutic oral care. We want to um, inform our patients that dentistry is safe and remove any active decay. Again, xylitol gum evidence at least two or three times per day has a significant impact on delaying this transfer of mutant streptococci from mother to child. Remember to message to the patient, do not share eating utensils, cups, pacifiers, because they're sharing bacteria. When you see these white spots, this indicates high levels of bacteria. They're bombarded. This little child's being bombarded with bacteria, whether it's grandma or mom or brother. And again, this is progression of early childhood carries and these were cases that I treated at all levels here at the County Health Department and others. So communicate with your obstetric team, advocate oral health on behalf of pregnant patients. And um, we have a couple of questions here. If there are any more questions, please type them into the chat area and we're gonna be bringing up Liz here in just a second from Perio Protect. What local anesthetic is recommended for pregnant patients is most OBGYNs recommend lidocaine plain. However, dental offices do not have plain lidocarpals. Well, order, order plain lidocarpals, that's all. If they want lido without epi, just order, have a few without epi. Thanks, Phyllis. Can pregnant patients receive nitrous? Yes. I've used nitrous on pregnant women in indications where local anesthetic isn't going to work. But again, we need to find out, can they breathe through their nose? And if you're using a rubber dam, of course, that's going to change the levels, right? So just be cognizant of that. And again, for those of you who are of childbearing years, be sure you get yourself or your employer gets you a nitrous oxide badge so you can monitor the level um, of nitrous oxide you're being exposed to. Because let's face it, those scavenger systems and dental practices where you have the little saliva ejector going into the HV and so forth, they're garbage. And nitrous oxide's a heavy gas. It doesn't matter if you're in a room next door. I wouldn't take any chances. There's nothing hanging on the wall in these practices telling you what the levels are, right? So you definitely want to make sure you're able to monitor your levels. Okay, everyone, uh, current ADA guidelines for lead aprons for pregnant women. Um, since it's not advised for patients anymore, I'm not sure what the question is on that. Clara, send me an email through the website on that one. 
Uh, nitrous oxide causes spontaneous abortion in employees that receive cumulative exposure. Nitrous oxide is used as twilight uh, in many areas of the world, especially uh, childbirth, cardiac patients, and so forth. Recommended number of radiographs in pregnancy, the number that you need. If they need an FMX, if it's been five years, then you need a full set. Okay, I am going to bring up Liz uh, Nice, and she has a presentation from Perio Protect. And I hope you'll stay on and learn about Perio Protect because it's an excellent um, information for your pregnant patients or your patients who are thinking about conception. It's an excellent way to treat these patients without the use of antibiotics um, and it's long-term treatment. So Liz, I'm going to go ahead and have you log in. I see she's here. I'm going to go ahead and give her the proper, the proper intro. There she is. I see her initials. I do not see Liz yet. She's there. She is. Hi, Liz. Hi. I'm so glad you're feeling better. Thank you. I am two weeks tomorrow. More than a bad cold, Liz. Um, I'm just grateful that I'm turning the corner and I'm grateful to have you here, Liz. So everyone, Liz has 38 years of experience in dentistry, 31 in clinical practice. She has served as a director of clinical hygiene for a large dental service organization. She currently works as the DSO liaison and team trainer for Perio Protect. This is a good fit for Liz because she also has had a consulting career working with dental teams, improving their communication skills in case presentation tonight. She's going to focus on the benefits of hydrogen peroxide for periodontal care and the best practices for selecting patient candidates in case presentation. So again, treating women of childbearing years, uh, this is an excellent fit for you all. And Liz, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Thank you. So welcome everybody. Pregnant patients, they need our care, they need our knowledge, and they're just as afraid as we are. So I think by grabbing the bull by the horns and giving them the best care you can, not only for their own health, but their future child's health as well. Uh, Paraprotect is safe for pregnant patients because we make hydrogen peroxide in low doses in breast milk. Um, and what Paraprotect is, is basically a home care tool. We all say we love our patients um, and we take care of them. And we say, we're gonna show you how to take care of your mouth. And we tell them that if you have really good oral hygiene, you can keep yourself healthy. We know through research that most people only spend 45 to 75 seconds when they're brushing, flossing, rinsing, water picking, not because they don't want to, just because as we're working, we start thinking about the things we need to do. And even if our patients gave us all the right amount of time, two minutes for brushing, three minutes for flossing, and anything else you add, they can only reach 2.4 millimeters below the gum line. That's research. So think about that. How many patients, including your pregnant patients, have pocketing deeper than two, three millimeters? <laughs> it's almost a stupid question. So therein lies the craziness. Even if they do everything right, they're never going to get all the bacteria. And that's why Perio Protect was developed. We're basically um, two parts. We have our medication. Our medication is a hydrogen peroxide gel at 1.7%. But the key to our, our product is our tray. And what makes this tray different than a night guard, Invisalign tray, a whitening tray, is we create an inner peripheral seal. It's almost like a custom suit designed to hold that medication in place long enough for it to lice the cell wall. Our research shows that our gel breaks through the cell wall, the biofilm in 10 minutes. And after that, it releases all this oxygen gas, creating this oxygen rich environment, almost like a mini hyperbaric chamber to allow this oxygen rich environment, to allow the aerobic bacteria to thrive, giving that patient a healthy biofilm every day. So you don't change anything you're doing chair side. This just makes what you're doing chair side successful. There are side effects. 
whiter teeth and fresher breath. So we know that biofilm forms and they, it forms in a group, right? It forms this community, community grows, create the slime layer. Then when it's big enough, they shoot planktonic cells from inside themselves to outside themselves to go establish that biofilm elsewhere. We've chosen to go with a broad spectrum antimicrobial or antibiotics because antibiotics get those planktonic cells super quickly. They actually have a difficult time breaking through that slime layer. That's why it's a two to three week regimen. But a broad spectrum antimicrobial like hydrogen peroxide, or our research shows our gel, breaks through that slime layer in 10 minutes. And the reason we've chosen to go with a broad spectrum antimicrobial or antibiotics is antibiotics get that planktonic cells quickly. They just have a difficult time breaking through. The other reason is antibiotic resistance. If you're only able to kill some of the bacteria, the bacteria left behind are now resistant to that antibiotic, and now you got a superbug. And this is such a big problem that in 2019, the CDC actually stated, we're in a post-antibiotic era. We better use these drugs sparingly so that we're gonna have them available when we need them in the future. If you think about your diabetic patients, whenever a diabetic patient improves their oral health, their diabetes improves. We even have endocrinologists who recommend Paraprotect because those diabetic patients that have included Paraprotect have a significant drop in their blood sugar, their A1C. And we believe that's happening because now the immune system can focus on diabetes rather than periodontal disease. So a few key facts about our trays. We've been around since 2005. We've had FDA clearance since 2005. We are considered a prescription medical device. We can deliver the medication deep, but it's not enough to just deliver it deep. We can get a lot of things deep. The problem is our immune system, curricular fluid, wants to push it out. Our seal overcomes curricular fluid and allows that medication to stay in place. The reason why patients have such great success with our trays is we love to multitask. And most people wear these trays while they're doing something else. Number one, while they're in the shower, driving to work, exercising, watching TV. We have two gels, Perio Gel Original and Perio Gel X. The only difference between the two is Perio Gel X is sweetened with xylitol. Both are FDA approved as an oral debriding agent and wound cleanser. And the main reason we chose hydrogen peroxide is because we make hydrogen peroxide naturally in our bodies. In fact, we are exhaling a bunch right now because we produce it in our lungs. We also produce it in our livers. Our white blood cells make hydrogen peroxide and moms even make it in their breast milk. So it's super safe for our patients because it's natural. And it also has a six year long study deeming it safe by the FDA. They looked at hydrogen peroxide 3% or less and we're way below that at 1.7% over six years. And what they found that nobody had any cancerous activity or allergic reactions, they actually had everything we desired. Patients had less plaque, now called biofilm, less gingivitis, and the tissue had a really strong tinsel strength. So not only is it safe because it's natural, it has a six year long study deeming it safe by the FDA. Now patients will say, well, I'll just get the cheap stuff from the drugstore. These are two totally different products. Brown bottle hydrogen peroxide's mode of action is explosive. It's gone in like two to three minutes. And that type of explosive reaction can cause tissue damage and tooth sensitivity. Periogel and Periogel X are engineered to time release hydrogen peroxide consistently at 1.7% for 15 minutes. And after 15 minutes, it becomes inert. So if they leave the trays in longer, it doesn't hurt them. It also doesn't help them. Um, none of us like to spend money on the things we need, right? We don't like paying our mortgage, our car payment. We like going on vacation, buying things, going out to dinner. And that's why we focus on our side effects. Because we're creating this oxygen rich environment deep underneath the gum line, the anaerobic bacteria struggle to exist and therefore they don't poop or release their volatile sulfur compounds. And we always thought that there's more volatile sulfur compounds located on the tongue, which is why most fresh breath treatments involve a tongue scraper. But research shows that there's actually more subgingively. And it's because of this, that uh, patients who use our product can wake up in the morning without fuzzes on their teeth and their breath being really fresh. Another great side effect, whiter teeth. 
because we're using hydrogen peroxide at 1.7%, the teeth slowly whiten over five to six weeks with virtually no sensitivity. And if you think about it, what you're using in your practice for whitening could be 4% to as high as 40%. And I bet you have a bunch of patients that would love to have whiter teeth. They just can't use those products. Well, that's what happened here. This guy was the husband of a hygienist, could never use traditional whitening products that hurt too much. She finally made him a set of trays and at 68 years old, look how white his teeth are. I'm more excited about these sexy gums. <laughs> look at all that stippling. How many 68 year olds do you know where their gum tissue is that healthy? So we talked about working against the immune system. It's also important to support the immune system. Our immune system functions better with oxygen. The more oxygen you can pump subgingivally, the quicker tissue forms, the faster you heal. We need oxygen for, um, for all new cell growth to occur. We need oxygen for neovascularization. And what that is, is when you hold oxygen under pressure, which is exactly what our seal does, new capillaries form. Now you've got all these new blood vessels. You can pump a whole bunch of oxygenated blood to the wound so that healing can start. And it's because of all these new blood vessels that stippling shows up in just two weeks. Now we've been taught in school that periodontal disease is considered a chronic wound, a chronic condition. And what they've told us is if you cut somebody's periodontal disease out of their mouth and gather all those pockets together and involves 10 to 20 pocket sites or more, that wound would be the size of the palm of your hand. Now, I know this is a disgusting picture. It's actually my point. Because if you had a wound this gross on your body that wouldn't heal, eventually your medical doctor would send you to a chronic wound center. Once you got there, they'd stick you in a hyperbaric chamber two hours every day for six weeks to surround that wound with oxygen under pressure so you could heal on a very small scale. These trays were very similar to two mini hyperbaric chambers. And I use that analogy when I'm talking to patients. Think of yourselves as running a chronic wound center, because that's what it is. What a great course on pregnancy. How many of your patients show up with pregnancy gingivitis? You can barely touch them, it hurts so much. Paraprotect is comfortable, it doesn't hurt. It's something they do at home. It keeps their mouth healthy. It helps protect that fetus by getting periodontal disease under control for their mother gently. Remember, they're making hydrogen peroxide in their breast milk. And so this is very safe. And I've never had, um, I lost my PowerPoint. I'm not sure where it went. And I've never had a patient uh, or, or an OBGYN say no to Perio Protect. There it is. I got it back. Um, Perio Protect is very simple to use. You simply talk to the patient about the product. Hopefully they say yes. You would send us a periodontal charting. Really good models, impressions or scans. We're getting those trays turned around in our lab in three days. So we're going to get those back to you in two weeks. You then start the patient at one time a day. I'm sorry, two times a day for 15 minutes, at least an hour apart. Most people do it morning and night. They do that for six weeks or until their first tube is complete. Then they drop down to one time a day for 15 minutes. Um, examples, this patient, perio maintenance patient, showed up, 101 bleeding points, used it for six weeks, dropped down to four. The actual definition of a perio maintenance according to the AAP states, to prevent or minimize the recurrence and progression of periodontal disease in those previously treated with peri periodontitis, gingivitis, periimplantitis. So if patients are showing up with bleeding, we have to ask ourselves, are we hitting that mark? Because bleeding is not healthy. So this picture on the left is probably about 20 bleeding points. After six weeks, they had one. Think about it preventatively for gingivitis patients. People, this is the only form of periodontal disease that's reversible. Rather than waiting till the bone starts to break down the connective tissue, treat it when it's only in the gums. Give them a healthy biofilm every day. They'll love the whiter teeth, fresher breath. I strongly believe it should be a part of every periodontal protocol because we love our patients and we want them to succeed by telling them flossing and brushing is going to be enough. It's not. We know so much more that there's biofilm left behind. And so by giving them a healthy biofilm every day, your work is going to be even more successful. For patients with disabilities, this is a patient 
Um, it was actually Dr. Hobbs' dad. He had very severe, um, oh, I can't think of the disease at the moment. Uh, it'll come to me where they're shaking a lot. Uh, family ties guy has it. I'm drawing a blank. It doesn't matter. He couldn't physically brush his teeth. His home health caregiver was having difficulty brush his teeth. In just two weeks, using perio trays, she wrote a script. So the home health care worker had to place the trays. Yes, it's Parkinson's. Thank you so much. Where the home health caregiver had uh, to place the trays. And look at the difference. And his quality of life went up. We have patients that invest a lot of money in restorations. And no matter what, they show up with these round, red, swollen margins. This is one month of tray therapy. Look at the difference in those tissues. This really means that you love your patients when you're giving them tools to help their work not only be successful, but look successful as well. Implants, super, super pricey, right? Number one loss of an implant, peri-implantitis, peri-mucositis. Um, I see a question here that says, is it recommended before or after scaling and replaning? It just depends. If you have a patient who has a heck of a lot of inflammation or doesn't want a brush and you want to get them somewhat healthy before you start, that's a great way. You're going to get rid of a lot of that bacteria so you're not getting that into the bloodstream. However, most offices will use them post-placement to help maintain it. Um, offices charge anywhere from the lowest I've ever heard is $256 an arch to as high as $600 an arch. This is something you have to decide what you want to charge in your office. And we walk you through all of that. We do have studies out there that uh, show exactly what this is. All of this research is available to you at perioprotect.com claims. And basically they are double arm study. And this is showing in shallow pockets. This gray line is when scaling and replaning uh, was taken care of. And you can see that we had much better results even when we were using it before the scaling mark, but even better when we used it post scaling. Um, and this was on the bleeding of, of even deeper pockets. We had even better results than scaling alone. Um, you get what you get after six months, but in bleeding reduction, we dropped and then we just leveled out. So if after six months, you don't see the results that you need, you've got to look elsewhere. It even works on smokers. We have one outlier where that smoker did not get the results that we required. Um, yeah, Paige, well, you know, I have a lot of offices that complain about price and they're stuck on a price point, but we have to remember why do patients come to a dental practice in the first place? It's not because they have insurance. It's not because they like you. I mean, those things help. The main reason they walk through the door is they want to keep their teeth. And it's our job as a professional to help them do that. And if we know that by giving them a healthy biofilm every day, that it can help keep their disease in a remission state and keep them healthy and give them what they want, whiter teeth, fresher breath, isn't that worth some kind of um, investment into it? Because really, that's what we're here for. We're here to keep their infection at bay, to keep their mouth as healthy, as healthy as possible. And that's where PerioProtect comes into play. Our research shows that we need 10 minutes of contact time. This is a live dead dye study. There are lots of hydrogen peroxide gels at 1.7 on the market. We are the only one with research that shows that we work that we need at least 10 minutes, live dead dye study, any bacteria that are green or alive, any bacteria that are red or dead, and 10 minutes are kill time. Um, and not all hydrogen peroxide gels are the same. One of them even releases formaldehyde when it's used orally. So the protocol changes if you want to use the trays pre-scaling, right? Um, you would start them at three times a day for 15 minutes. We can make that tray without a periodontal charting it has a universal seal and is going to get them started. Can a hygienist get this for patients or dentists only? Um, if you're in a state with a practice act, the lab script should be signed by your dentist because it is made in a lab. Um, but mostly it's done in the hygiene chair, taking very little dental, uh, dental dentist time. 
Maybe someday we'll insurance will cover it. We get more and more coverage. We do have CDT codes uh, that were new in 2021. So not getting as much coverage as we got before. This patient um, refused to brush his teeth. Look at all of that gooey mess. This is what hydrogen peroxide will do. It actually makes it a soupy, goopy mess. So it comes off much more easily. And the reason that happens is because the hydrogen peroxide gel will break apart the protein chains that hold the deposit together, making it softer, easier to remove. And in this day and age, when we can't rely so heavily on our ultrasonics, having a softer deposit is a big deal. And we have to remember, yeah, you might use a laser. Yeah, you may be doing GBT, but that's all chair side. Problem is, as soon as that patient walks out of the office, the same bacteria is growing back. They can't get it all. Why not give them a tool that can transform it? Even those patients that refuse to brush their teeth. This is this man after a cleaning. Notice, not a lot of bleeding and redness because those gums are maintaining health, even though he's refusing to brush his teeth. The toxins are there, the bacteria to cause inflammation. Now it's rare and a patient might experience insensitivity. In fact, if you have patients that you know already have sensitive teeth, I recommend they do a fluoride treatment before they even start tray therapy. And they can do that fluoride treatment with the Paraprotect tray because of its seal, it delivers the fluoride right to the tubules. What you would have them do is do three 20 minute applications of a fluoride gel at least one hour apart over a 24 hour period. Example, 8 a.m., 10 a.m., 12 p.m., those are all at least an hour apart. Their sensitivity should be gone. <clears throat> if they're still experiencing sensitivity, repeat that regimen one more day. If it's still there, it's something else. Clenching, grinding, cracked tooth, leaking, filling, etc. We all have patients that experience dry mouth and they hate it. Like patients with Sjogren's, taking a lot of medications, maybe going through chemo, radiation. Six days a week, I have them use the hydrogen peroxide gel for 15 minutes. One day a week, I have them use the fluoride gel for 20. The next day, go right back to the hydrogen peroxide gel for 15. It doesn't address the cause, but it'll address the effects because it's addressing the biofilm and it's adding moisture. We recommend a fluoride gel over paste because it comes out of the tray more easily. We recommend sodium over stannous uh, because of staining. And I love Ultra Ease by Ultradent uh, just because it comes in those syringes. Um, patients love us. And we did, a we did uh, an exit survey to find out. My favorite is they would recommend Paraprotect to others. We have over 2,500 Google reviews on our website, all five star. None of them complained that it was too much money, maybe one. Uh, everybody was so happy that they learned about Perioprotect and they made the investment. At Perioprotect, su your success is our success. Our goal is for your patients to have the right outcomes. We have tools to, for you to help um, pro talk to your patients. We try to have a, a, a really nice product that comes in a beautiful bag. It's great for perio maintenance, gingivitis. Uh, patients with initial scaling, implant, restorative, bad breath, general whitening, prevention, post-orthodontic. Remember, bleeding isn't normal. So patients shouldn't be ble bleeding. They should be showing up with the healthiest mouth around. We shouldn't have to keep going over proper toothbrushing technique, knowing that they can only get 2.4 millimeters below the gum line. No matter what device they use, correctly or incorrectly. Love your patients even more and consider including Perioprotect into the treatment plan. Um, we do have a special offer that's available to you by clicking on that tab. You can sign up um, and have a training by one of our great teams and we will walk you step by step exactly how to get through everything. So this is our contact information. My extension is 132. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. I saw, I answered some as they were rolling through. Um, my patient ran out of gels and or ordered some tubes on Amazon. It's supposed to be RX only. <clears throat> That's a great point. Uh, during the pandemic, we actually started selling online because dental offices closed. We price our gel higher than dental office. Most dental offices sell it for with occasionally running 
um, specials. And the reason we stayed online is because there's other gels that are out there that have side effects that don't work as well that people were buying. And we want them to make sure that they can get the right product. We always refer them to your office first. Um, we don't really advertise our own website very often at all. So any other questions or anything I can answer? Liz, I wanted to remem remind everyone that um, they can tap on the banner at the top of the screen too, and it will take them to the PerioProtect's uh, landing page. They can also tap on it and uh, save or bookmark that URL if it's information they'd like to take back to their practice tomorrow. It's a great way to do that. You can save it to your phone, etc. cetera. Um, your presentation is in their handouts as well. So they all have your contact information. And let me double check here on the questions. Um, from uh, Dr. Tetley, I agree with you, but some patients generally cannot afford it after paying for the SRP. Peripect will go far if the price is looked at. I prescribe it to my patients after SRP and I've seen the results. The only drawback is the price. And I think, you know, you can look at uh, some of those therapies out there that are adjuncts to um, scaling and root planing. And I think patients um, may be challenged by the price. You know, there are some that incorporate these within the treatment for the quadrant scaling and root planing. Is that right, Liz? So it's not a yes. separate cost. Mm -hmm. So rather than doing like a Greek style restaurant where there's a thousand choices, they just say for your complete periodontal care, um, your the cost of your treatment is going to be $1,500. And it's going to give you the results that you're looking for and maintain those results long term. Because anytime you remove anything from a treatment plan, whether it's irrigation, arrestin, laser, GBT, that changes the outcome. Right. And we're the, supposed to be the experts. And we know that we want it all in there. So that's why they came to you. And if they trust you and believe in you, it doesn't really matter. They want to do the things you recommend. And all we can do is let the patient know that it's here. And how can we help you get there? I'm not aware of what um, arrest and cost now per quadrant. I know what it was about 10 years ago, but um, I do know that anytime we can offer a therapy that is an antimicrobial, because even um, minocycline, which carries a lesser risk for C. diff, the risk is still there. And the risk for antimicrobial resistance is still there. So anytime that we can offer a patient and really something that can be used at home, long-term, it is safe, uh, improve and effective, I think is a great um, opportunity for them to look at the whole treatment is holistically, not just a procedure based um, one time event that's going to require, you know, three month follow up appointments. They're, they're in it for life, really. We know this, this is not, this is not a quick fix at all. Okay. Yeah, so and go ahead. Liz. So I would to anybody that wants to read the reviews, it's paraprotect.com forward slash reviews. And they're all listed right there. And you will see that people love the whiter teeth, fresher breath, and they love their providers for talking about it. Absolutely. I want to thank you for being here, Liz. And as always, it's great to have you here presenting with me. Um, I do want to thank everyone for being here this evening. Uh, once we log out. Uh, you all will be redirected to complete the quiz. You'll also receive a reminder email with the quiz and um, we will be on our way. Be sure to check our website for upcoming live presentations. I think we have one every day this week, just about xerostomia and so forth next week. Um, plenty more. We have infection control being offered twice a month. Um, so thank you all for being here. I'm going to close out now. And again, you are going to be sent right to the quiz.